Welcome to Journeys Through Sociology, a series of interviews with presidents of the International Sociological Association. I'm Lalebe Mohanyan, and today our guest is Emmanuel Wallerstein, who was president of the ISA from 1994 to 1998. Professor Wallerstein received his training in sociology at Columbia University, after which he went on to teach at the State University of New York at Binghamton for almost 25 years holding the position of Distinguished Professor of Sociology. He began his career as an Africanist, doing research on colonialism and national liberation struggles in Africa throughout the 1960s. But by the 1970s, he had shifted his focus to developing the world systems analysis perspective for which he has become best known. As the director of the Fernand Radel Center for the Study of Economies, Historical Systems, and Civilizations for almost 30 years, he has worked to promote research undertaking historical analyses of large-scale social changes. In 2003, Professor Wallerstein was honored with the Career of Distinguished Scholarship Award from the American Sociological Association, and more recently, his lifetime of contributions was recognized by the International Sociological Association with its first ever Award for Excellence in Research and Practice. He is currently a senior research scholar at Yale University from where he is joining us today. Thank you so much for being with us today, Professor Wallerstein. Delighted to be here. Thank you. So I'd like to begin today by asking you how it was that, that you were first drawn to sociology. Well, I'm not sure. When I went to Columbia College as an undergraduate in the 1950s, they were so strongly into general education that you didn't even have to major in a particular subject. Uh, they would simply ask you each semester, what's your subject of major interest with no requirements so any subject that I took two courses in that semester, I named as my subject of major interest. Uh, and there it was. But at some point, I had to make a decision. And uh, I, I was very attracted to sociology, among other reasons, because I decided with my sort of interest all over the place and not restricted to any one uh, social science, uh, they would be the most ready to tolerate this. And uh, I think, looking back, uh, I think I was right, that I would have gotten into much more trouble with what I tried to do in any other uh, department. So I'm very pleased to have decided to become a sociologist, or at least nominally become a sociologist. So in that sense, within sociology, you feel that there's more kind of space for interdisciplinary work and work that, that incorporates history and... I think the problem is sociology is so vaguely defined in so many ways that it was hard to say that things were outside it. And it's much easier in, in some of the other disciplines. And, and you see that as a problem as well? No, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's a virtue. It's a virtue. So. Yes, yes. So, uh, Professor Wallerstein, you know, in, you began your career as an Africanist, um, and then you kind of shifted to a much, you know, more broad attempts to understand the social world. Do you, do you see that as a transition in the, the kind of sociology that, that you've done over the course of your career? Well, yes, in the sense that initially I was studying very present-oriented phenomena. And at a certain point, I said to myself, I, I'm running after headlines, uh, and, and that it doesn't make sense. And I, and I decided uh, I had a very bad idea, which turned out to be work well for me. My idea was uh, calling all these countries in Africa new nations. Well, if they're new nations, there must have been old nations at some point uh, who were once new nations. So why don't I go back and look at these old nations who were once new nations and see how they worked? Um, that got me back to the 16th century. That, among other things, got me back to the 16th century. It was a very bad idea, actually, but it it had this. It turned out 
very well because that got me into uh, uh, understanding that there was something called the world system. I called it a world system anyway. Uh, that uh, this had a history, uh, that it had a structure. Uh, so and that uh, I'm sorry advised. to interrupt you, Professor Wallstein, but for, for viewers, uh, could you just very briefly give a sense of what it is you mean when you refer to a world system? Well, you know, the most of social science in the late 19th, early 20th century uh, took the state as a unit of analysis there, and they tried to figure out what happened within the state and anything outside the state was exogenous, okay? And I said, that doesn't make sense. The decisions that are actually made in real life, in the economy, in the political system, in the culture, are not made in terms of the state that isn't the unit that actually operates. Mm -hmm. And there's some larger unit, which I call the world system. A world system, not the world system. Mm -hmm. A larger entity within which, in fact, uh, social decisions are made, which has its structure, which determines things, and it is that. So that I call a world system, and a world system analysis says the unit of analysis must be the world system. Uh, there are different kinds of world systems, but the unit of analysis must be the world system and not the state, which is a, 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 a simply a functioning element within this world system. So, so that's what I mean. Do you, and, and you developed this, this perspective in the, in the 1970s, but do you feel that, that scholars doing work today on, on globalization and, and, and coming to some of those kinds of uh, conclusions are, are, are thinking along the same lines or? No, some of them, some of them. But actually, uh, Globalization is a, is a, is a uh, mantra uh, that says that something new has happened in the last, depends on which person you read, in the last 10 years, in the last 20 years, in the last 50 years, but recently. Uh, and it's changed everything. Now we're globalized. Before we weren't globalized. I say that's, that's although some people say I'm the father of globalization, I... I I absolutely deny this. Global, uh, for me, the world system has always been global in the same sense that we talk of globalization today, of products that cross frontiers, um, uh, are made in, in multiple different countries, of, of, of uh, um, an interstate system which is uh, changing all the time in terms of its functioning and so forth. This is not new. Mm. This is going on for 500 years uh, in the modern world system, so, which is one I spend my time studying. Is this perhaps an example of, of, you know, scholars who see this as a new phenomenon, and is this one example of the way in which, you know, being well-versed in history and in historical approaches, which is something you've, you've always kind of um, promoted, is, is, is helpful I, to I've sociology? All, I, I've, I've always promoted it and preached it and got people, persuaded people to uh, to look beyond the immediate present, to understand that uh, the historical development of the phenomenon is part and parcel of the present day analysis. Right. So actually what I call, I call the work working on historical systems because I believe that you have a system which has structures, which means they're the same, 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 and it's historical. And every second, every every nanosecond, things are changing. Mm -hmm. So you have to you have to put together the absolutely constant change with the absolutely constant uh, um, sameness. Yes, and structure. that's of course a very difficult thing to do. Yeah. Uh, um, it's difficult psychologically. It's difficult intellectually. Um, uh, to do it, and um, we can argue about how well Mr. X or Miss Y does it. Uh, some do it better than others, if it's, but it's hard. It's hard. It's hard, and yet it's easy. Students say to me sometimes, or they did say to me when I was still teaching, ah, but it's, I can't, 
I don't know all these things. It's too much. And, and I say the amount of actual data that you need to study the whole world system and to study a, a very tiny mini structure in a, in a local community is about the same. Uh, and uh, it's the you perspective. Just to, you just have to get it into your mind that you you can handle this um, uh, reasonably well. Uh, and uh, and uh, I've I've actually fact read. Is there are a lot of people out there now doing world systems analysis and handling it quite well. Right. And I, I've so, read in a piece that you wrote for Global Dialogue for the ISA's Global Dialogue, where you. You even question whether or not your vocation is sociology, and you refer to yourself as, as a historical social scientist, which That's I correct. imagine, you know, at times could have been a difficult position to hold within sociology, which kind of leads me to my next question. You know, as a sociologist over the course of your career, what have been some of, of your greatest, you know, challenges? Well, I think that there, there are two things. One is what you just said, my identity, so that... Uh, I, uh, I think of myself as a historical social scientist. I think other people should also think of themselves as that. I think that's the only thing you can be, but other people don't. And, and, and uh, you know, s s when I wrote a piece as president of ISA, I wrote a, uh, one of my letters to everyone, and I, and I, said, I talked about the importance of history. Uh, Somebody wrote me and said, but you're the president of the International Sociological Association. What are you doing uh, promoting history? And I, I pointed out that, you know, not only I, but if you go back to uh, such a, a clear historical, so, um, a historically named sociologist as Durkheim, he said the same thing. People don't, they don't read Durkheim anymore. They don't read Weber anymore. Weber, they don't yeah. read Marx anymore. Uh, you know, these people had a lot to say. So that was one. But the second thing is, I thought it was very important to try to build structures that would enable people, because we were a minority within the profession, would enable them to, to, to work together and to advance things. But when you say we were a minority, is, we meaning... There's people who are, are interested in world systems analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, building structures is a very tricky thing because you, you, there's a scylla and charybdis uh, in this. The scylla is that you're, you become a, a sect and you expel people who don't follow the exact line. And that's, that's, that's just ends reasonable analysis. And the other, the Charybdis, is, well, you define it so loosely that everybody can get in and say, I'm, I'm doing that. Uh, that's what a lot of people who do global research, so-called, uh, now do it, and, and, but they don't have the idea of world systems analysis. So how do you do that? You try to wiggle in between. Uh, and I've tried to, to wiggle in all the structures, the, the Fernand Baudel Center itself, uh, the political economy of the world system section of the American Sociological Association. Uh, uh, they no longer exist, but there used to be international colloquia on the world economy. Um, and, uh, and their uh, review as a journal. Uh, all these, the, the principle of them all was, yeah, have, allow a debate uh, of different people with different emphases within, but don't don't let anything in. So uh, I've tried very hard to do that, and I think, generally speaking, we've succeeded. That as a as a collective group, we do have a lot of debate, constant debate within us, but we do stand for something, uh, and that something is a point of view, a perspective which we hope everyone will eventually adopt. And so, indeed, that's, that's a problem. We don't, we're worried about, or I am worried about, the, the day that we become, uh, how shall I say, the new establishment. If we become the new establishment, 
uh, that's dangerous. That's dangerous. Yes, it is. And, you know, you already, Professor Wallstein began to refer to something that I wanted to ask you about, your work in ISA and attempting, you know, clearly you've talked about trying to create space for this, these, this kind of perspective within sociology and your work in ISA. But I know that you're also, your, your presidency is recognized as, as making efforts towards making space for scholars from the global south also. Um, and yes. for bringing, and so was that, was that an objective that you had? And what were your objectives? Very, very much so. I had two objectives as president. One objective was uh, to, to, to get away from the belief that the, the only decent sociology that was being done was being done in the United States and maybe a few countries in Western Europe. And after the rest of the world was, you know, just mm -hmm. hopelessly weak. And it's just nonsense. Mm -hmm. And it's very important to understand that people come with different perspectives because of their geography, because of their different position within the world system. And it's important for us to learn from them as they are learning from us. It's got to be a mutual learning experience. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that was very important. And I tried to do it. In, I tried to pursue this in various ways while I was president. I, we had special uh, colloquia in, I think, 10 or 11 different regions of the world mm -hmm. in which I had as a principle that though the colloquia, colloquium would be a small group drawn from the region, there would be three or four people coming from outside the region mm -hmm. to participate in that so that mm -hmm. they could bring the other perspective right inside. Mm -hmm. Then the second thing I was worried about as a president was language. Of course, English has become, for geopolitical reasons, the lingua franca, mm -hmm. uh, of not only of, of sociology, not only of all scholarship, but of course of the United Nations and of course of, of everything that goes on everywhere. Language is a, uh, how shall I say, the, the lingua franca is a geopolitical accident, but it's a reality. It's a reality. Most people it's very useful. If I go to a country where I don't know the language at all, like, let's say, Korea, which I, to which I've gone many times, uh, of course it's useful for me to be able to speak in English and find people who can respond. But it's also, it's the same problem. It, every language is a perspective on the world. Mm -hmm. And unless we create a culture in which people speak many languages mm -hmm. and read many languages, and talk to people in many languages, uh, we are narrowing ourselves in. Well, I tried within ISA with limited success, I have to say, because it's still true that if you go to an ISA meeting, uh, most, almost everything goes on in English. And if you have a French session or a Spanish session, it's a ghetto into which a uh, only a few people go and other people don't go and you don't have any sessions and still other languages. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think, I think that the ISA is clearly still struggling with that challenge with you know, translations. I of them highly, but there is a real problem of overcoming the sense that uh, a minimal lingua franca, uh, a bastard version of a language because it is, it's not, it's not real English, it's a, it's a limited form of English that we all speak as a lingua franca, uh, is, is, is the optimal way of pursuing interaction among scholars across the world. So, I mean, it's interesting, that's also what characterizes Durkheim and Weber, not only their, their, their you know, amazing handle of history, but also the many languages they spoke. Um, so. And we should remember that in, before the First World War, the, the lingua franca of, uh, of scholarship, all kinds of scholarship, was German. Yes, yes. English and French physicists communicated to each other in German, mm -hmm. the way German and French physicists today communicate to each other in English. And what's changed? Geopolitics. Right. 
So, <laughs> Professor Wallerstein, I, I, I always end these, these interviews by asking uh, what you may have cared to have been if you weren't a sociologist. In your case, it's, it's kind of an interesting question because you've managed to be and do a lot of things under the uh, wiggle I'm room well, of sociology. I'm not sure. I rejected all the others. <laughs> I thought of journalism. I thought of politics. My, I thought of other disciplines, but I rejected them all. So I'm not sure I wanted to be anything else. Anything I'm happy with who I am. Even you. if you were not an academic, how about? Is there something that you... But I am. Which you I are. like to be an academic. Yes. I chose that. So you would do it all the same? Yep. Yep. Well, thank you so much for, for being with us today, Professor Wallerstein. It's been wonderful having you. Thank you. This has been another Journey Through Sociology with Emanuel Wallerstein. You can find the entire series of interviews on the website of the International Sociological Association.